Welcome to the RiskAdvisor.com podcast. I am Jim Henry and here with my good friend and co-host, Sal Lavreri. Today's topic, saved money is not money saved. How many times have we seen this? CEOs and security directors try to go with the cheapest price. Here's a little free advice, pay now or pay later. Except when it comes to risk assessments, where the bigger the price tag, the better. Except when you get stuck with identified uh, writing risks that haunt you for a long, long time. So, Sal, what's your thoughts on those, uh, those points in our subject for today? A real pain point for me happens to be when the companies go out and they ask for risk assessments to be done. And I know we're going to be talking about general contractors and, and the overall scope of things and the pricing, but the real pain point for me is on the risk assessments where you get a company goes out, they want a facility needs a risk assessment done, they get it, they get the they get the risk assessment. And the thing that they wind up getting is a list of liabilities. They really don't get a whole lot of answers. What they're getting is liabilities. I had one particular customer who had a risk assessment done and they called me up and they said, you know, can you kind of help us with this? And well, what's the problem? And they said, well, there were recommendations that we just can't fix. He's like, what's that? And they said, well, it was in New York City, a major cross street that runs literally right down the middle of right down the middle of crosses, uh, Manhattan Island. And the recommendation was to prevent explosives from blowing up the building prevent truck traffic from being in the middle of the street. And it's just an unreasonable recommendation. I mean, it's just something that is just a problem. And if there was ever an explosion or an explosive device brought to the building, it would always come back and say, well, you knew about the risk. What did you do about it? And it's stupid things. Like it goes from the, you know, the ridiculous to the sublime sometimes. And that's just one of those pain points with it. But I know even before we get to the risk assessments, we have to get into looking at those systems that are put into place and that stuff that we really want to get into today. So, Jim, what do you think? Well, I, uh, I think this is going to be uh, a topic we could talk for, uh, for two weeks on. So uh, we'll, try and keep, uh, we'll try and keep on point, which, is, uh, uh, which can be a challenge for me. But, uh, so uh, today's guest, uh, bringing in uh, more of the systems integrator perspective and, and, again, many decades of experience, you know, like myself, is uh, Howard Schild, who is the uh, principal and founder of Advanced uh, Electronic Solutions, Inc., AES. He founded that in 1994, and AES has become one of the, or if not the largest privately owned security systems integrator in the New York metro area and serves clients uh, throughout the United States. Uh, welcome, Howard. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So uh, two problems uh, that we're going to talk about here in the first segment. And uh, the first one is cost is king. So let's talk about the process of how a job gets quoted and who runs the bid, uh, particularly when a general contractor is involved. Correct. Well, we certainly have a lot of experience with that. I mean, in, in most of the projects, certainly, uh, that you get involved in these days that are large projects, uh, the GC does get involved, and going back, as you said, many decades, originally, way back when, the uh, the consultants did have a lot of sway into who uh, did get a project, and they looked at it more carefully, I think, from the point of view of the experience of the contractor, as well as the technical expertise. It seems now, with the change to the GCs controlling so much of it, it's more about the nuts and bolts. And do you have your BIM in the job? Do you have the proper insurance? Do you have these different items that I think often are, are not really having to do with your technical expertise, where you're being looked at, you know, very frankly, as a drywall guy or the guy putting in the carpeting? where we have a much longer life with the customer and we go for a much longer period and we have to service and maintain the systems. So I think that's where I've seen such a big change in the industry now, where very often, in fact, in the old days, the the uh, consultants would even do risers and very complete packages to bid from. 
And now, obviously, because of cost cutting, the packages are much smaller. They very rarely do a, a riser package uh, without getting too technical, but the specifications themselves is very minimal. And I think they're under the gun, too. I think, you know, more often than not, sometimes, you know, one of the funny aspects of this is I sometimes see, you know, everybody's doing cut and paste these days, and they sometimes see the wrong customer you know, on actually the specification because of the cut and paste and that little little part got uh, inside, not not at the, the header and the footer, but inside within the, the spec itself, they have the, you know, the wrong uh, well, customer. That's the whole, that, the whole time with yeah. the green M&M. And I, I know I'm going to, I know I'm going to screw this up, but there was, there was a rock band. I don't know if it was Queen or Kiss or whoever it was, but there was a rock <laughs> yeah. band who in their agreement was that they would did not want any brown M and M's in the dressing room. <laughs> they wanted bowls of M and M's, but they did not want any brown M and M's. And the entire concept was, if they walked in and found brown M and M's, nobody was paying attention. And they said, "If you can't pay attention to this, what are you? What else are you missing?" Right. And it's a, it's a great lesson learned. Hmm. Well, yes. you know that that those sparse specs wouldn't be as damning if indeed the filter on the selection of the integrator was conscious of the fact that the integrator does need to bring in a lot of knowledge and complement, you know, the design. And, you know, not all GCs, but some, you know, will will try and broaden the net on the candidates, you know, for a project to drive the price down. And they need that that additional input, you know, to fill in the gaps, you know, on a design, but they aren't going to get it, you know, when they're going to be, you know, opening it up to uh, to integrators that are more contractors, I'd say, than, you know, than integrators, because they're not bringing in that domain knowledge, you know, the, the, the experience and the, and the technical expertise from the design side to complement, you know, the, the basic framework that's been laid out by, uh, by a consulting firm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the interesting things that, that's happened to us in the past, and, you know, this, this comes up sometimes with, you know, the idea of value engineering projects. And that's often, you know, we're requested to do that, which is, you know, puts us in kind of an odd position because a consultant was hired to write the specification. We're asked the value engineer, if we come up with things that we think are opposed to what the design consultant came up with, then we, you know, wind up with a possible alienation of, of the people that were originally involved in the design. But, you know, one of the things that uh, happened to us a couple of times, and this is because of our industry start changing so much and not really from, we had actually pretty much from a value engineering point of view, but the idea that, as we moved from way back when in 2000 from VCRs to, to DVRs, uh, we had a big client that we did a very large project in the city and the consultant was still at that point doing the uh, VCR thing. And we had, they had just come out with uh, DVRs, I think using like 20 megabyte uh, drives in there. You know, now we're up to, you know, 80 terabytes and stuff like that. But at that point, you know, it was very early on, and I understand the consultant, you know, was probably reluctant. It was new technology, but we suggested it to the customer. And actually, the customer thought it was a brilliant idea, and they went with DVRs, some of the earliest DVRs that were out there, those Intellex units, mm -hmm. actually, which I'm sure, Jim, you're probably familiar with. I don't know, Sal, maybe. But Jim goes back to the days of tubes. Exactly. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we so we came up with that, and then uh, a little later on a hospital project that we were bidding, you know, it was during the changeover from to NVRs, and you know, it was the days that this this hospital already had like a thousand cameras, and in those days, you know, you could always find where the security office was because you could walk down the hallway and see the drooping ceiling tiles because there's like nine thousand pounds of of <laughs> coax up in the ceiling. And you just follow that down. You knew where the security office was. So at that point, I guess that's about 10 years ago or so, you know, when the industry was changing from DVRs, which was still using coax, but moving to uh, NVRs, 
and we suggested that, and they they loved the idea. Well, you know, when you you bring up an interesting point when you're when you have a design mm-hmm. consultant and you're looking at it, and then you, you're coming in for the value engineering. That from the end user side of it, that's almost an it's almost an appropriate approach because at least you got a design engineer that's going to understand the tech and the spec and everything that you need. And at least you hope that they're talking at somewhat on the same level and you can have an intelligent discussion or a conversation about it, a debate. I was involved with a project that was a a government issue, a government project. And the, the general contractor was cutting stuff out again on the pricing and didn't understand the requirements and, you know, we were looking at stuff, you know, as simple as, you know, dual redundancies coming in from the telecommunications lines. And it's, you know, one of the fed from two different central offices and he's looking and he's going, what are you crazy? We just need one line coming in. And I said, yeah, but what happens when the guy with the backhoe comes out after the building is built, digs up the line and cuts us? You know, we need another. They don't understand that. And it all comes down to the price. And, you know. Yeah, was, I, don't, I remember, recall, uh, what was it? Many, I guess, 10 years ago or so when that backhoe was working out, I think, in Jersey and they cut the lines and the the airports were out. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. That that was pretty wild. I guess somebody didn't have the right as-builts at that point. But uh, I remember that. as well wild stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the importance of of having that collaborative relationship between the integrator, the end user, you know, and the consultant along with the GC at the table is, you know, really important because, you know, how many times have we seen, you know, a consultant is brought in and, you know, he's really trying to cover him, really trying to cover himself and, and point out all of the, of the issues that, you know, that, that need to be addressed from a security and a risk perspective. And that may not necessarily line up with the budget. Yeah. And uh, sometimes, you know, those, that, that deployment goes out there and, you know, it's driving the price up. You know, we talked about driving the price down by bringing in unqualified integration. Well, this is this can drive the scope up. So the key is, you know, if you are going to try and bring that down within uh, a reasonableness to the to the budget, it really needs to be a collaborative effort. And we both had the experience, you know, where you know, uh, or a consulting firm is receptive to input, you know, from the integrator. And we've seen other circumstances, you know, where the consulting firm will dig their heels in and, or uh, they are excused from the process entirely, you know, by the Mm -hmm. GC, they write this abstract, you know, set of requirements out there. And now the integrator is left there, you know, with the GC, you know, uh, going through what, what's going to be eliminated. And then the consultants brought back in later in the project and goes, what happened to my, you know, what happened to my project? So uh, I'm sure you've had that, you know, that experience as well. And, and like I said, we, we, there's good and bad in, of, of every stakeholder, you know, I don't care whether it's the general contractor, integrators, manufacturers, you know, what have you, uh, you know, the key is to understand that this is good projects, you know, generally, you know, are a team effort, you know, with collaboration between, uh, between all those stakeholders. So. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that. And, you know, very frankly, you know, a few of the groups we work with, like Deuce and Bell, Ventor and Centaur, we've worked with them on many projects over the years. And, you know, it's, as you said, a great collaborative effort, a team effort. They look for our input. And, you know, you have to remember, too, in, in many times, they're being asked, the consultants, to be fair to them also, Um they're coming in, as I had described before, you know, we might have already three or four buildings that we've done, and they're working with the end user very often, determining where, say, readers and cameras are going to go, but they're not quite involved in the infrastructure, especially now with everything being networked, so they don't really understand that part necessarily. So that's why it has to be a collaborative effort at that point. You know, to, for us to get involved and, and talk about, hey, where are where are all the video servers now? How old are the video servers? Do they have to be upgraded? Things like that. So, you know, it's refreshing for us to work with, you know, a group like Dusabella, lady by the name Maria Gonzalez. We do a lot of work with. Um, she's, you know, very well versed in in the equipment that's out there. And again, she will work with us to. Uh, to figure out what's really the best 
best way to proceed for the customer because again, it's not just an isolated building anymore. You know, it's these regional systems and national systems, and they're all linked together. And we have to work as a team to make that into a solid system. Okay, we're going to take a, a quick break before we go into uh, the second part of uh, the show. We just want to remind the listeners that you're listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and me, Sal LaFreary. We're going to invite you to subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We're going to ask you to do us a favor and go to the show, download it, and please write a review and tell us that how much you like the show. Your opinion really does matter to us, and we would also like to ask you to share this podcast with your friends and colleagues so we can get the word out about our show. So going into the second part of this, we want to talk about you know, when things start to go wrong, when you get the consultant and when you get the, the design engineer or the customer at the end, when it goes bad. Let's talk a little bit about pulling the customer out of the fire. Some of the things that we see is that there aren't certifications, there aren't issues that, you know, things that the customer doesn't want to pay for up front. Howard, I'm sure you got to have, between you and Jimmy, got to have probably a couple of hundred stories about customers that got in trouble and how do you get, how do you get them out of the fire? What are some of those things? Well, I would go back to the certification that you mentioned certifications and systems. And I would say, you know, certifications are certainly important, but I think experience personnel is probably more important than the certifications, you know, from, from my viewpoint, I've seen a lot of people with incredible certifications. It's probably in all industries, not just our industry that with a lot of letters and acronyms, you know, after their name, but not a lot of experience, real world experience. So, you know, from our point of view, whether it's our project managers or IT folks, I think the experience part is very important. We pride ourselves on our company that, you know, we, most of the folks that are with us have been with us for many, many years. And that's when I talk to an end user and I do a presentation, I always talk about that. It's not about having thousands of employees. It's really about having the same you know, half a dozen employees that are going to come and and work on your system at your site. But, you know, speaking in terms of, you know, what can happen when customers um, wind up in a situation where, you know, perhaps as an example, uh, one of our large customers, they were um, doing a new site, actually uh, in Westchester, they were doing a new site and the powers to be, it actually we're thinking of putting in a system that was not the right system because we were presently in another location. This talks to the operations part of the business again, being in sync with, with the others. We had already started upgrading the system to another system. In fact, we were up in, had already started the upgrade, but Some other powers within the company had already decided they wanted to go with another system in another building. And, you know, then we had to get involved. And, of course, the GC, you know, saw this as, oh, my God, you know, now I got more complications. That's all he saw. But the reality is. the two favorite words of the GC, change order. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, right. But, you know, the reality is it would have cost the customer you know, probably a few hundred thousand dollars after the fact, several months later, just to pull the system out that was, you know, being specced as the wrong system at that point. So, you know, we these are the kinds of things that we see. And that's why, you know, it goes back to the, you know, Jim's point about being a collaborative effort and a team effort between everybody, between the customer, between the, the consultant, between the GC and, and everybody else. Well, that is uh, that really uh, highlights the the title. You know, saved money is not money saved. In some cases, you know, having that broader view, uh, you know, to, holistically to what uh, the application is, you know, and and other considerations, you know, within the within the client that may not have been evident, you know, when the when the spec was written for a particular job. 
you know, is so important. And it, and it may be a little, a little bit more of a, of a derailment or, or, a a scope change, you know, with, uh, you know, with that individual project, but without a doubt, that is going to save the customer long-term more money. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a squeamish position because, you know, uh, legacy integrators that have long relationships with the operations groups, you know, in these businesses, you know, are then in that pickle, you know, when you're a subcontractor, you know, to the GC on a project, the GC expects you are not going to have any conversations with the end user Mm -hmm. uh, other than it's through them. So, you know, you try and do that. But when you when you run into that situation, you know, where, you know, the GC has got his blinders on, he doesn't want his scope to creep, you know, no matter what, no matter what the implications are to the customer long term. That's where you really have to be creative in how you, um, you know, and how you, you get that message across. Because in the long run, the job going south is not in anybody's best interest and cl- any of the stakeholders that are in the project. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. No, I agree with that. So, you know, and one of the things see, we had a while back, we was talking to a doctor and she was saying that the, one of the big problems they have today on, online is the what they call Dr. Google. You know, everybody comes in and they're already self-diagnosed, right? And now it's pretty much the now it's pretty much the same thing today, right? With the equipment, you spec out something, you make a recommendation, and they go online and they're coming back with, yeah, but this is saying this and this is saying that, or, or on the pricing, you know, is, is problematic. You're running into that on your side. Yes, absolutely. Um, I've probably run into that over a hundred times at this point. <laughs> Um, we're quoting systems. We got a camera quoted in there and, uh, cameras are the best. I mean, certain in access control, um, you know, we, we use systems that are pretty much only sold to dealers. So there's a certain control over that. Um, again, due to certifications and experience. Uh, but especially now on the video side and, and, so much so because the IT departments are involved also. And there's definitely some little bit of channel conflict, if that's the way to describe it, where an IT person gets involved and they've bought a few web cameras for some of the stuff they're doing or a few cameras that they bought that they put in their um, data centers. So, for instance, we come in, we bid, you know, a project, we have whatever it is, 50, 100, few hundred cameras, and they go on Amazon, they see a price for a camera, and they go, oh, you know, we get this camera for $100, and you want to charge us 130 or 140 or whatever, and the reality is that and we have to go through that whole process that, okay, you just, somebody who's making Minimum wage is just putting that in a box and sending it to you. That doesn't include an on-site warranty that right off the bat of a year that we normally would give on a construction project, which right then and there is about another 10% or so. We, the insurance policies that we have to get on a, a large construction project. I know uh, Jim, you could relate to that. Used to be one million, two million. Now it's two million, four million. It's quite expensive. Um, New York City or New York State, especially, still has this wonderful scaffold law, which they took away from most of the other states. But because of that, people aren't writing. Most of the large insurance companies are not writing insurance in New York for construction anymore. I know this is a little bit off topic, but I remember when they were building the Tappan Zee Bridge and it was supposed to cost $2 billion, which I'm sure it went way beyond that. But the original price tag for $2 billion included $400 million for insurance, you know, just to give you some relationship as to what's going on with insurance costs in New York. That was the government doing it. So these are the things that pop up. There's no support at that point. If you buy something from Amazon, there's no on-site support. There's, there's the, we all know now there's SSAs, which are software support agreements, which is another topic, but these are things that also require a cost. Um, Talk to us a little about SSAs because I'm, I'm sure somebody's not too familiar with them. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, software support agreements. 
again, going back to the old days when we were lugging coax around, those things didn't exist. But now it's a very big feature of our industry as we've changed into really on the, uh, a software uh, industry at this point with, and specialized software. And IT departments uh, are used to spending, I'd say, roughly 15 to 20 percent of the original cost for uh, software support, whether it's um, a Cisco, whether it's our own company dealing with the sales force. They get a very large fee each year to maintain your software and to give you updates and new drivers or whatever it is. Same thing is happening in our industry right now. Interestingly enough, you know, again, you know, tying this back to the, the thing with the Amazon thing, but the the customers now, um, they're becoming more educated. They realize they need SSAs, which they're same thing. They're paying 15 to 20 percent, probably of the original cost of the software. But when it comes back that to the integrated side of the business, and we actually have to go on site and service the systems. Um, we're probably only at about, you know, seven to 10%, something like that. We send a truck out. We have trained people also, whereas the, the software folks are doing basically everything they do remotely. Uh, very rarely do they send an engineer on site, but, um, it's something that's now become commonplace in our industry to to have SSAs and analytics is, I think, going to be taking over uh, a lot of our industry right now. I think that, you know, the giant control room, you know, we start, when we started in this business, it was like a pile of nine inch monitors, you know, all piled up on some desk and, and like the coax, the desk was collapsing under the weight and all these things were piled up there. but. You know, now we're getting to a point and a couple of our customers, we've put in analytical software to actually watch real time what's going on on the video system. And it makes more sense to have some very good analytical software and just be looking at certain views that are popping up on one large screen as opposed to having eight or nine or 10 46 inch monitors and thinking that your security staff is looking at all those pictures at the same time, which is really an impossibility. So um, I see some tremendous advances happening in that using, you know, artificial intelligence. And I think really that that's where we're going. And, And all this again, SSAs, doesn't matter. You know, it's analytics. They're not selling any hardware. It's all software. That's all they're selling. So there's going to be your initial cost, and then there's going to be SSAs. I I think that's a surprise to a lot of people, though. I don't think a lot of people, I don't think a lot of the end users recognize that. I think you buy the system, and then you expect the maintenance cost for the system, and all of a sudden, this, this SSA pops up, and it's like, Wow, this is not something that they're thinking about, considering or even budgeting for. Mm-hmm. Well, it's very important that that be identified to the end user right at the front end. Again, these, you know, the SSAs are are a necessary element of the system design and of the budget, but it should also be pointed out, like you say, that you know, warranty for product is also a necessary, uh, you know, element, but. Um, you need that glue that ties it all together, which is what the integrator brings and the experience in the deployment of solutions. Uh, when it gets to the analytics, uh, understanding where those applications are going to make sense or where, where it's going to be more problematic and just generate a lot of information that's not going to be usable, uh, you know, given the, the, the use case, you know, for by the end user. So a, you know, open communication and collaboration between the manufacturer, the you know the end, the integrator, the end user, and what have you, and 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 the GC understanding that so that it is all holistically integrated and supported because you know that's where that's where compliance is is a relevant relevant piece. But you know, like I say, you can have one cert from a particular manufacturer on a project. Well, that's great. At least you at least you're recognized by the manufacturer that you're certified. But it's it's a lot different when you have a hundred people. 
you know, and a hundred million dollars worth of experience, you know, with, with a platform versus one guy that you just happened to send to class, you know, two weeks ago to pick up the cert. Right. So yes, it's compliant, but you know, experience really gives you the perspective to be, uh, the value added, uh, to bring the value added to the, to the relationship. So with that, we'll bring it to the end for segment two and state that you are, Again, listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and Sal Lafrere. We invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and to subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We're going to ask you do so as a favor and go to the show listing, download it, and please write a review and, and like us. Your opinion matters to us. We would also like you to share this podcast with your friends and colleagues so we can get the word out about our show. So moving on to segment three, horror stories. We'll try and keep this one short and go to the, <laughs> and go to the David Letterman top 10, as they say. Sal, you've got a little experience in this area here. Why don't you uh, kick tee this, this one up? <laughs> right, we'll kick this one off. The So... Uh, doing consulting for a uh, for a client, and it's a turnstile project, and it, the job, the entire job, was probably about five hundred thousand dollars. And the bids come in, and there's a difference of about ten thousand dollars between the first place and second place. And we sit down with the powers that be, with the C level folks, and we're talking about it. And I said that my recommendation was that we were going to go with the company that, you know, came in the highest, which was $10,000, again, over a $500,000 job. And they look at me and they go, why? And I said, well, it's in reality, it's going to be the cheapest insurance policy that you're going to get because we know the job's going to get done right. I had some questions about the company number two, company number three. Figured company number one would be at 10000 Tried to explain it's a $10,000 insurance policy. They decided, nah, that's nah, okay. We're going to go with you know the cheaper company. And I just threw my hands up and said, okay, you know, it's, all I can do is I can advise, right? As, as a consultant, you can't get wrapped around the axle, right? You, you you learn in the beginning. You take it to heart when they don't listen to you. After a while, you realize, you know, you just you're getting paid for your advice, and it's up to them to do what they want. They wound up going ahead with this other company, and interestingly enough, I got the big laugh out of it. When they went to set the turnstiles, they set them all wrong, and they wound up having to rip the turnstiles out. They had to go through all of the core drilling, all of the piping, all of the electric again, and it wound up costing them probably about another $200,000 by the time all was said and done over on it. And I just sat there and looked at the CEO and never even said, I told you so. I just kind of looked at him. <laughs> yeah. It, it happens, you know, it's it, it's those stupid things that, that occur. But you guys have to have way more experience in this than I do. Well, I mean, I, I think some of the, you know, you, you just have to hold, when you know that they're going down that road, you know, you have two choices. You know, you can call them out for being as stupid and myopic as, as they are, but that's generally not a good career move. Mm. So, you know, what I found, uh, you know, has the greatest return is to be respectful and say, I'm sorry, you know, that you're making that decision, but here are some things to watch out for going forward. So, you know, just kind of seeding those, I told you so's in a, in a, in a friendly supportive manner, you know, we value the relationship. We look forward to additional business, but you know, here are some things that you just might want to keep an eye out for. And sure enough, you know, they more often than not, they come to bear. And I think some of the best jobs are the ones that I didn't get the first time, but seeded those, uh, seeded those concerns. You know, it's, uh, you know, there's a, there's a reason why we have a, a cost structure that we do because it costs, it, it's expensive, you know, to keep the right people, to give them the right training, to, to share those experiences within the business. I mean, it is, it's the experience, Howard, that, that, you know, that you spoke to earlier. 
And, uh, you know, it's a challenge again, to be, to not be condescending to the other stakeholders that you're, you know, that you're working with, but, you know, history will repeat itself if you don't ra- remind people of that history. <laughs> right. They have, they have, they have short memories, you know, and, and, and when the, and when the budgets get tight, you know, and, 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 you know, people are looking for, you know, ways to, you know, to cut costs, you know, there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. I say, you know, and I, one scenario I know we were faced with, you know, there was a network design that came on one project and, and the budget that came in for, for, for basically the, the backbone for the network for the project was in the millions of dollars. It dwarfed the entire security budget for the project. And fortunately, in this case, and, and this goes back to my experience, I happened to be with, with Ducebello as well. And, mm-hmm. and you know, so uh, Phil Santor says to me, he says, so Jim you know, what are we going to do here? You know, this is, this is, you know, I said, you know what? I said, it's not that the IT consultant did a bad job. They called out a great network, Mm -hmm. right? But it's unnecessary for what we're, let's think about what we're doing here. You know, this is not a trading floor where microseconds matter, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, for, for the, you know, for the, for the security system, we can more than adequately for, 10% 10% of this grandiose, you know, sonnet that was being, uh, you know, designed, providing a dual redundant, you know, uh, fiber backbone and, and, and a network for, and, and still have more than enough headroom for anything that we can foresee, you know, putting, putting onto the network. And it, and it worked out great. So yes, you can, you know, encounter problems like that where you say, well, how do I get 90% of the cost out? You know, if there's a will, there's a way. And it can be done effectively, but it all comes down to communications and collaboration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it always reminds me of the story. And I've actually said it to customers when, you know, we get into this price thing, you know, about the old ladies who keep going to the same restaurant, even though the food is terrible, but they keep going because, you know, the portions are big and it's cheap. And they, so they keep going to the same restaurant, even though the food's terrible, but you know, we run into that all the time, you know, where there's always churning in our industry. Over time, what tends to happen is, you know, different uh, administrations come in. The folks you've been dealing with over many years, they leave, somebody else comes in. Why is your maintenance so high? The typical question. Well, the maintenance is X because... You have a million dollars in equipment there and we have to come and we and we service your system and we take care of the labor. We take care of the parts. Well, we really just don't understand why it's so much. Well, it's your decision. If you don't want to, you know, buy maintenance, it's your decision. But understand that, you know, the maintenance contract customers, you know, get service first. Okay, typical. One of the situations we had. Big law firm, um, they were looking, they got rid of their maintenance. They were looking to save money. I remember talking to them about it and saying, look, you know, there are things when you have a maintenance contract, you don't have to look at every, go crazy looking at every service ticket because there's many times where there's repeat calls because we have to come back to troubleshoot it or it's a particular device and not all the devices are on, on all the service vehicles, so we have to come back. I am just have a concern. You're not used to seeing that type of stuff. No, it's fine. It's great. Sure enough, they dropped the maintenance contract. Several months go by. We're doing everything, time and material. And the next thing that happens is, you know, you guys are coming here an awful lot to repair the system. What's going on? Well, first of all, your system's 10 years old. That's not, you know, that's number one. Number two, you know, we got to come there. If you call us, we come, we troubleshoot the best we can, and we take care of the system. Yeah, but it seems like when you're doing this, you're, you're changing the most expensive parts first. Listen, nobody in this business has the control over their technicians in the field that they're telling them to use the most expensive equipment first. They're they're just troubleshooting. They're technicians. This is what they do. But again, you know, it just speaks to the point. It's, you know, penny wise and dollar foolish. And, 
you know, whether it's maintenance contracts, whether it's SSAs, whether it's going for inexpensive equipment, at the end of the day, it winds up costing more money. And well, a lot one, of it is even just aggravation. Right. One of the uh, one of the things that, that also gets down to education of a customer, you know, back in the, you know, again, dating myself to the 60s, 70s, and 80s, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. was, uh, it was easier well, for the listen, customer. You, you know. I, I'm glad you can remember back that far, Jim. <laughs> you know, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> it was easier back in those days, actually, you know, to justify your maintenance agreements because... You know, you were always on site. Yeah. I mean, in those days, you, you you weren't remoting in. You didn't have the software support. You know, you didn't have the professional services. You know, maintenance truly was, you know, the truck out there, you know, changing limit switches and pan and tilts and tubes and cameras and what have you. It was very hands-on. And there was a lot of time spent in the field. Now, the support has become more virtual, uh, soft, you know, the, the software support agreements, a lot of the back end work, the professional services are all provided, you know, by the integrator as a bridge between the end user and, and the manufacturer. And it, it's an education process that the customer needs to understand. Just don't count the number of times you see a technician, you know, with his head under your, under your desk or in your, in your equipment rack. That is not the only thing that the, exactly. the integrator is providing you. So, you know, providing some narrative, you know, or some, uh, you know, audit trail of the different activities that you provide under service agreements is, um, you know, is really key in having them understand that they're getting, you know, yeah, appropriate I, value. That is a great point. Uh, I left it out, but I would agree with you that I would say right now 50% of our service is probably done remotely. With IT people um, looking at systems because of the driver problems, interface problems, glitches in the software, you name it, it's it's what goes on right now. Uh, you know, the, the beauty of the fact that most of our systems are now in, you know, working over the via the network, which, by the way, is another issue. I mean, we know right away, you know, we get that call over the weekend that, Several or maybe 20 or 30 cameras went down at the same time. Now, we know from experience, 20 cameras did not break down. What we know is, oops, the IT department was doing some fiddling around with the network over the weekend, which is when, of course, they normally do it. And we get the call at 2 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. That's why things went down. They decided to take our IP addresses for somebody else. You know, all these wonderful things that now go on, which, uh, again, sometimes you're talking about the 70s and 80s makes you long for coax again in the ceiling. But unfortunately, that's well, that, not going to happen. Then you have to, then then you have, have to train the customers also how to change the dates now because, you know, you can't have the VCR just sitting there blinking with date on it <laughs> forever and ever with the wrong date from 1960, you know. Yeah. Well, the, when, and when the crisis occurs <laughs> and when the crisis occurs where they have, you know, a bunch of cameras that are down – you know, some some end users will want the visibility of well, they, you know, there's their bucket truck up there up at the camp, so the you know the stakeholders can see what's going on, and you know what really is happening is it's behind the scenes. You've right. got to have the network guys in there trying to figure out what's going on, and it may not be as visible that you're reacting to the to the problem, but you know that assessment, you know, of the problem will save a lot of wasted time. You know, whether it's on uh, whether it's a delay in getting the repair, if it's under maintenance contract mm -hmm. or if it's T&M and they just want the busyness of a, of a bunch of technicians showing up at where all the camera sites are that are down. You know, that's not the most efficient way to, to attack it. You have to um, you have to be using your, your your judgment there. So, again, it's all education of the of the customer. Correct. Guys, I think we've, uh, we've just about run out of time. But uh, Howard, we want to thank you for joining us today. Now Thank in this you. conversation, I think this is this is something we got to have you back and just have a roundtable discussion about this. Anyway, you've been listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and me, Sal LaFury. We're going to ask you to subscribe to the show and like us on our social media sites like Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Remember that you can hear the show on your favorite podcast platform. And of course, you can always stream it at the risk dot com. Once again, thank you for coming in. Thanks for listening, and we hope you tune in next week. <laughs>